Hello, everyone. My name is Claudia Matos Avolesi. I'm a professor for the history of art at the University of Campinas and one of the organizers of the next CIHA World Congress Migrations, which will take place next August in Sao Paulo, Brazil. In the name of the CIHA Organization Committee, today I want to welcome you to the CIHA Pre Congress series, Art Worlds of Brazil, a program of 10 lectures created in collaboration with the Clark Art Institute to offer a comprehensive view of the rich and diverse art traditions of Brazil from the colonial period to contemporary art. Art Worlds of Brazil will offer an introduction to the main collections, historical sites, and artworks in the country, critically examined by local art historians specialized in different aspects of Brazilian visual culture. The lectures will be posted once a month for public access on the Clark and CIHA websites, and a closed webinar related to each lecture will be offered to the participants of CIHA World Congress in the week after the posting of each lecture. Whether you will take part in the CIHA World Congress in Sao Paulo next year or not, we hope that this program will encourage everyone to actively engage with the richness of the visual culture in Brazil and get to know a little more about the scholarship produced by local art historians on this material. Vera Beatriz Siqueira is professor for the history of art and architecture at the State University in Rio de Janeiro. She has written widely on 19th century, modern and contemporary art and architecture in Brazil, and is considered an expert in Roberto Bulemark's work. Let's welcome Vera Siqueira. Hello, everybody. Thank you, thank you, Claudio, for the presentation. And first of all, I have to say that what I will show today has no pretension to be an extensive panorama of, mo of modern architecture and landscaping in Brazil. Instead, it will be an attempt to understand how, how what we call Brazilian modern architecture was established, trying to think about its origins, the main concepts and problems involved in its rise, and some sources of the criticism it received. Unfortunately, many excellent architects, remarkable buildings, and striking gardens were left out. Although I am really sorry for that, and believe me, I'm really sorry for that, I had to make some difficult choices in favor of a historical path that I hope would make sense in the end. Siegfried Gédion wrote the introduction to Henrique Mindlin's famous book about modern Brazilian architecture, published in 1956. He employed nature metaphors to qualify the phenomenon of its rise. And I quote, it blossoms like a tropical plant, skyscrapers sprout everywhere, contemporary architecture has taken root uh, on tropical soil. These metaphors were, for Gédion, an attempt to explain the prodigious emergency of modernity in a country with belated and irregular modernization. How could a country like that witness the birth of the internationally recognized Brazilian style honored in 1943 by the Museum of Modern Art in New York with the celebrated exhibit Brazil Builds? In an article written in 1951, Lúcio Costa defined modern architecture in Brazil as a miracle. For him, modern Brazilian architecture is situated on top of a double hierarchy, expressed by the paper's title, a lot of construction, some architecture, and a miracle. The entire argument of the article has on this purifying process of modern architecture in Brazil, the passage of pseudo styles marked by falsehood, extravagance, artifice, inadequacy, in Lucio Costa's words, for this new, pure, genuine form carried out by truly creative artists, pressured by sacred obsession of unraveling the formal world not yet revealed. The word miracle, with an undeniable religious background, holds a strong belief in the naturalness of architecture itself. It would be the expression of a kind of innate, natural nationality, incapable of asserting itself, but through successive miracles. 
Nevertheless, let us see how architectural modernity was understood before the miracle, before the Brazilian style had become the canon. In the 1910s and 1920s, the so-called neo-colonial was considered modern. The movement has germinated in Sao Paulo from the work of the Portuguese architect Ricardo Severo. He ran the campaign for traditional art in Brazil, which consisted of architectural projects, articles, interviews, and lectures. In one of his lectures in 1914, Severo explained how it could be possible to see the return to the traditions of colonial architecture as a synonym of modernity. And I quote, do not try to see gentlemen in this traditionalist veneration merged in nostalgic poetry from the past, a manifestation of romantic and backward nostalgia. Indeed, to create art that is ours and of our time, do not search reasons, origins, sources of inspiration far from ourselves, from the environment where our past took place and in which we will, we will pursue our future. With the central premise of connecting modern architecture with the native environment, the new colonial style unfolded in the nativist movement led by Lucio Costa from the 1920s. In conceptual terms, nativism filtered some of the principles developed by neocolonial or traditionalist architecture. The criterion for this conceptual filtering was the praise of the simplicity found in traditional popular architecture, both in spatial typologies and in constructive elements, such as verandas, ceramic tiles, tile panels, rough stone backings, handmade materials and techniques, sloping roofs, and musharabis. A series of pretty nostalgic projects appeared, such as Oscar Niemeyer's Grand Hotel in Ouro Preto, Minas Gerais, from 1938. Built in a colonial city, considered one of the most important centers of the so-called Brazilian Baroque art, the hotel incorporated picturesque reminiscences of traditional Brazilian architecture in the reinforced concrete building. In the catalog of the exhibition Brazil Built, Philip Goodwin said, and I quote, the hotel looks very much at home in the 18th century setting. The obvious reasons are the sloping tile roof and the occasional use of itacolomi stone. Less obviously, it is the design itself, bold in outline and delicate in detail, which has a sympathetic relationship with the native Baroque. Like most, like most critics, Goodwin understood nativism as a precursor of the Brazilian style, although it continued to be used by Brazilian architects even after the consolidation of modern architecture canon. In the 1950s, Lúcio Costa conceived the buildings of Parque Eduardo Guilli in Rio de Janeiro, where he applied interpretations of traditional native architecture to the scale of apartment edifices. The result was a colorful composition with a diversity of textures unified by modern purist volumes and inserted in lush tropical vegetation. While the new colonial and nativist defenders were trying to integrate modernity and tradition, some architects in Sao Paulo were committed to another reading of a local adaptation of modern architectural achievements, such as rational form, standardization, and the economy of construction. In their projects, the idea of simplicity visually translates into prismatic volumes, straight lines, no ornamentation. One of these art architects was Rino Levy, who designed the Cine Ufa Palacio in 1938. In a city like Sao Paulo, very proud of its modernity, the inauguration of the movie theater was a cultural achievement seen as another step in the way of modernization. A few years before, in 1931, a newspaper article from Sao Paulo discussed the victory of modern architecture over traditional taste. And I quote, those who were hesitant were soon captivated. This is the era of short and straight hair, of very simple attire, of large toes suit, 
large toed shoes. A modernist house is a house that has achieved the ultimate simplicity. A photograph of the building, however, points out the disparity between the newly built movie theater's modernity and its surroundings, the neighborhood's traditional houses, a donkey drawn cart, and a smaller one to be pulled by one of the men leaning against the building's modern columns. This modernizing ideal certainly influenced the industrial Paulo de Almeida Nogueira to choose the project by Álvaro Vital Brasil and Ademar Marinho as the winner of the closed contest for constructing the new headquarters for Usina Sucareira Ester, Ester Sugar Plant in Sao Paulo. Although there was no clause in the contest notice providing that the building should be modern, Nogueira's choice fell on the project that gave rise to the first modernist building in the city, bringing together offices and residential apartments. Although the idea of collective housing was not widely accepted at the time, the Esther building ended up being occupied by the cultural and social elite of Sao Paulo, from the 1940s, writers, journalists, bohemians, painters, artists, started to live in this place, including the modern architect, Hino Levy. Famous residents received celebrities on the rooftop terrace where there was a rose garden. The linking of a part of Sao Paulo's intellectual, political and artistic life to Esther's space demonstrates that this building reflected the ideal of transformation and modernity. The series of modernist houses designed by Gregory Warszawski in Sao Paulo since the end of the 1920s was undoubtedly very relevant to developing this collective ideal. At the time he conceived his own modernist house in 1928, this one that we can see, he encountered many difficulties. In a letter to Siegfried Gedeon, Warszawski reported the countless struggles he had to face during the construction. Since the project's approval, the high price of materials such as cement and glass, and the lack of technical training of the workforce. A vital aspect of the connection between the modernist houses and Brazilian surroundings was the gardens designed by Mina Klabin Warszawski, the architect's wife. The tropical plants, especially the cacti from Brazilian backlands, were blended with architectural forms, compensating and reinforcing the geometry of the construction. Mina designed gardens for their own house at Rua Santa Cruz, for the modernist house at Rua Itápolis, inaugurated with great public attention in 1930, and for another one at Rua Bahia, also from 1930. The gardens combined lawn areas, geometrical plant beds, animated paths made by rectangular stones and native flora, stimulating a new rational vision of the Brazilian landscape. In 1932, when Lúcio Costa and Warszawski worked together in a residential project for the Schwartz family in Copacabana, Rio de Janeiro, they invited Roberto Borle Marx to create the landscape design. Thus, in his first experience as a landscape architect, Borle Marx created a garden similar to Mina Warszawski with geometrical plant beds and aesthetic, aesthetical use of native flora enhancing the effects of modern architecture and connecting local nature with modern forms. A year later, in 1933, the first tropical architecture salon, organized in Rio by Alcides da Rocha Miranda, named as its honorary president, Frank Lloyd Wright, who had visited the country two years, two years beforehand. It also nominated Lúcio Costa, Warszawski, and the engineer Emilio Baumgart as precursors of Brazil's architectural modernity. The choice of honorees and the idea of a tropical architecture seemed to indicate that the links between nature and architecture were central to creating national art. Based on this, one could surmise that Brazilian architects concerned with modern architecture adapted to local conditions would turn their attention to Wright's work, whose organic conception indicated an intense dialogue with nature. 
repercussions of Wright's work are present in projects by some architects active in Brazil, such as Antonio Garcia Moya and Flavio de Carvalho. However, three years after the American architect appeared as a key figure in founding tropical architecture, Le Corbusier received an official invitation to be a consultant for the project of Universidade do Brasil's campus and for the Ministry of Education and Health Building in Rio de Janeiro. For Lucio Costa, that opened the doors to the miraculous development of architectural modernity. So let's see the miracle. Le Corbusier had been in Brazil earlier in 1929, returning from a trip to Argentina and Uruguay. He gave two conferences in Sao Paulo and two in Rio de Janeiro. Paulo Santos, a historian of Brazilian architecture, qualified this conference as the capital fact of the decade. In 1936, Brazilian architects, auto-proclaimed modern, recognized the filiation to Le Corbusier's principles. They saw in his internationalism and functionalism a possibility of positive integration into modern society. The filiation, however, could not be without some adaptations. The ideas of rational control of form or functionalist rigor needed to be freed from their social and political dimensions, which would demand here in Brazil, the concrete confrontation of problems such as poverty, lack of civility and ideological conflicts. The origins of this form hid the contradictions of the modern utopia in Brazil, such as those mentioned by Roberto Conduru, and I quote, the almost exclusive identification of architects with the elite and the state apparatus, the dependency on imported construction materials, building components and equipment, the simulated machine-made appearance of buildings constructed by handcrafted methods and their consequent high cost, and the employment of poorly educated or illiterate people in the production of apparent technical sophistication. The construction of the Ministry of Education and Health Building signaled the appropriation of modernist architecture as the symbolic function of a new projection of Brazil. Since 1930, President Getúlio Vargas, Getúlio Vargas instituted an authoritarian, nationalist, populist, and modernizing government. The Minister of Education and Health, Gustavo Capanema, commissioned in 1935 a competition to design the building. The winning project by Archimedes Memori did not correspond to the official modernizing concerns, nor to Capanema's aspirations to be at the forefront of a work with international relevance, which motivated the invitation of the French Swiss architect. The group of Brazilian architects formed by Lúcio Costa, Oscar Niemeyer, Afonso Ridge, Carlos Leão, Jorge Moreira, and Hernani Vasconcelos adapted Le Corbusier's architectural program, sustaining some of his principles. The adoption of simple and geometric shapes, the pilotes, the garden terraces, the glazed facade, the horizontal openings, the integration of the internal and external spaces, the use of brise and the work with pure volumes. However, the most significant change was the landscaping. Instead of a paved area with lines of palm trees, Bule Marx, whom Lucio Costa invited to participate in the project, created a landscaped open space with curvilinear plant beds, stimulating a free circulation under the pilotis and promoting a new effect of monumentality. Furthermore, instead of a rose garden like the one at Astor Beauty, he also created curvilinear beds with tropical plants on the rooftop garden. We could, of course, understand Bourlemach's project as something predicted by Le Corbusier's urban ideal, which included the dialogue with the nature around the building. However, the wavy forms of Bourlemach's gardens create ambivalent continuity with the regular rhythm of the building's shape, adapting the theories of architectural modernism in a very different way. As Valerie Fraser pointed out, 
It's hard not to see these gardens as a deliberate ironic play on Le Corbusier and his theories. Fraser also understood that the city of Rio de Janeiro and its landscape were linked, not in the way Le Corbusier in 1929 suggested by a space age superhighway, but by the gardens of Roberto Burle Marx. From the 1950s, he was responsible for laying out most of Rio's miles of coastal parks, gardens, and prominence. This landscape is not an intervention of the type Le Corbusier had in mind, in, in the words of Fraser, I'm quoting uh, Fraser. This landscape is not an intervention of the type Le Corbusier had in mind, but it can be seen as a very Brazilian response to his grandiose idea. What is certain is that Burle Marx could only create something like that because of his previous experience a few years earlier in planning public gardens in Recife, cap capital of Pernambuco, in the northeast of Brazil. In 1934, the governor of Pernambuco invited a group of modern architects and urbanists to modernize Recife. Luiz Nunes led this group. Then he was in charge of the Council of Architecture and Construction of Pernambuco, responsible for erecting public buildings, adapting rationalist principles to tropical conditions. The team had the sympathy and support of local progressive intellectuals, who, enthusiastic about modern Brazilian culture, defended the local virtue version according to our technical and industrial possibilities of European architectural precepts. Among the modern architects, artists, and engineers who arrived in Recife around 1934 was Roberto Burle Marx. Ahead of the Directory of Parks and Gardens, he launched an extensive program of requalification of public spaces that involved the renovation of some of the leading leisure and communal living areas existing in the city and new structures. In this work set, the landscape architect sought to broaden a reflection about the green spaces of the modern town, highlighting four main dimensions, recreational, artistic, educational, and environmental. In an article published in a Recife newspaper in 1935, he said, and I quote, the modern garden represents in the big cities a true collective lung, where the urban inhabitant comes to breathe some fresh air, tired of the daily struggle in narrow offices, on paved streets, in factory environments. From an educational point of view, the modern garden aims to bring to the inhabitant of the city the love for nature, providing them with the means to distinguish the local flora from the exotic one. His landscape design visions adapted foreign models. For example, the water garden at Kew Gardens, London, was his inspiration for the central lagoon with aquatic plants from the Amazon at Casa Forte Square. He also modeled the Madalena Cactarium at Euclides da Cunha Square, filled with plants from the Caatinga or Sertão, the backland of Brazilian Northeast, after the greenhouses from the Botanical Garden in Berlin. These models, however, were combined with local cultural references and the study of native flora and its association in nature. That led to the creation of gardens, far from the traditional taste of the elite, accustomed to enjoying European flowers, such as roses or dahlias. Furthermore, the use of native plants acquired a more representational quality. Unlike Mina Warshawski's use of cacti, in Burle Marx's project, these species fulfill a more daring function. They became a concrete expression of the physical and cultural harshness of, Brazilian lands, of the Brazilian landscape. Unfolding the miracle. At the beginning of the 1940s, Juscelino Kubitschek, mayor of Belo Horizonte, capital of Minas Gerais, invited Oscar Niemeyer to design the set of buildings around the Pampulha Lagoon. Belo Horizonte was one of the first planned cities in Brazil, materializing Kubitschek's dreams of giving rise to an urbanized industrial society anchored in the utopia of a modernist city. 
The main idea for Pampulha was to create a leisure center for the city around a dam built to guarantee the water supply to the population, and at the same time, transforming this area into a symbol of modernity and progress. Nehemiah decided to explore the plasticity of the reinforced concrete in the buildings like the casino, the ballroom, the yacht golf club, the Church of St. Francis, and the Kubitschek residence. Lucio Costa understood that the ensemble of Pampulha was a turning point in modern architecture in Brazil, as Nehemiah took a new direction that was central to the creation of the so-called Brazilian style. He, Lucio Costa, qualified Pampulha as the beginning of a new era of eminently Brazilian architecture that was modern, but inspired by the tradition, rational, but open to the creative imagination, functional, but refusing the tyranny of the straight angle, international, but connected with local culture and nature. Of course, the work of Bulle Marx at Pampulha was also central for the disseminating of this vision. His landscaping proposals deepened his ecological perspective drawing on native flora and its study and collection on expeditions to the mountains of Minas Gerais, creating plant associations that were simultaneously ecological and of strong compositional power. He gave rise to gardens evocative of the local flora diversity and in a very pertinent dialogue with the forms, volumes, and textures of Nehemiah's architecture, the reflective surface of the lagoon, and the topography of the place. One of the main reasons for the success of Pampulha is that Nehemiah and Bulle Marx designed their buildings and landscape projects for an empty open space. Against these natural surroundings, a little far away from the core of the modern city, they could sketch their forms freely and convert them to icons. They could explore the formal possibilities without constraints, creating final solutions carried with great liberty, but also arbitrariness. The same goes for the project by Niemeyer for the Ibirapuera Park in Sao Paulo. The planned permanent architectural ensemble should house the main exhibitions commemorating Sao Paulo's 400th anniversary. Therefore, it should be the symbol of the modern, industrialized, and international metropolis, monumental evidence of modernity. Nehemiah's experience with reinforced concrete at Pampulha allowed the creation of a very bold and ambitious plan. In addition to the vast concrete pavilions that the Fourth Centenary Fair and Exhibition Program demanded, they built the architectural element of union between them, known as the Great Marquis, playing the same ordering role of the lagoon in Pampulha. Roberto Burle Marx did a landscape project for the park in 1953, but it was not executed. Nevertheless, it was considered a work of art and incorporated into the MoMA architecture collection in 1955. Bulemax was invited again in 1973 and 1991 to create landscaping projects for the park. Only part of the latter was executed in the sculpture garden in front of the Modern Museum of Art. Since 1952, Otávio Augusto Teixeira Mendes, a state civil servant who was part of the technical team of the Fourth Centenary Commission, had already begun studies for the park's landscape project. Compared to Burlemarque's project, Teixeira Mendes I was quite conservative. The use of native flora expressed a pastoral vision of the past. Still, the simplified proposal of woods and extensive lawn, lawn areas pleased Niemeyer, whose boldly shaped buildings stood out against a more neutral background. Simultaneously, in the opposite direction, Vila Nova Artigas also decided to concentrate on the possibilities of reinforced concrete. Still, he transformed this material into a political sign of dispoliation and constructive truth. As we can see in the building he designed for the School of Architecture and Urbanism at Sao Paulo University from 1961, 
His goal was to create clear and truthful enclosures for congregational spaces. Thus, the architectural space has two contradictory and complementary dimensions. It is an antagonistic presence to the surroundings, capable of sheltering men, and at the same time, a democratic and ideal organization in the interior. He broadened the political tone of his speech when he designed the Bear Poor House in 1967, built during the toughening period of the military dictatorship in Brazil. Supporting the concrete slab on wooden trunks, he claimed that, and I quote, this whole technique of reinforced concrete, which made this magnificent architecture that we know, is nothing more than irredeemable foolishness in the face of the political conditions we were experiencing at the time. In his analysis, Artigas put his finger on a critical point, the Brazilian state's iconic use of modern architecture. As we have seen since the beginning, modern architects were almost exclusively identified with the elite and the state. However, that characteristic became a little more disturbing during the military dictatorship. Moreover, of course, the project that was most affected by that was the new capital, Brasilia. Justice be done, Lucio Costa and Niemeyer conceived Brasilia within a context of developmental and modernizing ideals of a democratic government. The city was inaugurated in 1960, four years before the military coup by Juscelino Kubitschek, at the time president of the country. However, the constructions went on through the 1960s and 70s. The violent military dictatorship very easily transformed modern architecture into a symbol of its own. Brasilia, born in democracy, became the capital of the dictatorship. The desperate attempts of Costa to defend his creation returns to the idea of a miracle and the natural metaphors. In 1974, he stated, and I quote, say what you want, Brasilia is a miracle. When I went there for the first time, it was all deserted as far as the eye could see. Just the savannah, the huge sky, and an idea coming out of my mind. The sky continues, but the idea sprang up from the ground as if by enchantment, and the city is now spreading and growing. And I think that all that, despite the machinery used, was done with the hands. Infrastructure, lawns, roads, viaducts, buildings, everything by hand. White hands, brown hands, hands of the suffering mass, but not resentful, that is the beam of this nation. Although Costa used the construction of the new capital to remind the collective force of the project, Brasilia was in reality the pinnacle of the experience of modern architecture as a free and arbitrary form. Both Costa's urban plan and Nehemiah's buildings favored the final form, disregarding the construction process, the working conditions, and as many critics say, even the living experience. Nevertheless, it is true that in this context, free from any constraints, working in an empty setting against a backdrop of deep blue sky, Nehemiah was able to create some iconic works, which still impress today. Symptomatically, there was no landscape project for the whole Plano Piloto, pilot plan of Brasilia. Lucio Costa invited Bole Marx to design the gardens of some public buildings and a few open spaces as Praça das Fontes, Fountain Square, and Praça dos Cristais, Crystal Square, in the urban military sector. He was also responsible for the landscaping of one residential complex, the Superquadra 308 South, and the green areas of the embassies of Germany, the United States, Iran, and Belgium. Although very successful, these gardens could not modify the city's general landscape. The extensive lawns with a few trees and shrub vegetation in concentrated areas. Nothing should interrupt or disturb the prominence of architectural form. Brasilia is the summit and the beginning of the rupture with the idea of a miracle. 
sur la Tibion de Miracle. The complex experience of building a whole city from scratch converted Brasilia into the most accomplished case of modern architecture in Brazil. Nevertheless, on the other hand, the construction of the modernist buildings motivated some attempts to rationalize and industrialize architecture and some criticism against the artificiality of rhetorical architectural modernity in favor of a concrete development process. The architect João Filgueira de Lima, known as Lelé, moved to the site of the future capital of Brazil in 1957 to develop and monitor the construction of the workers' quarter. Then in 1962, the anthropologist and educator Darcy Ribeiro and Nehemiah invited Lelé to coordinate the planning center at the University of Brasilia. There he introduces Brazil to precast concrete technology. A little later, between the mid 1960s and 70s, he created his first authorial projects, all in Brasilia. His work reached technical and symbolic maturity in the experience with the Sara Kubitschek network of hospitals. It started in Brasilia in 1980 and extended to other Brazilian cities from the 1990s. On this occasion, Lele saw an opportunity to develop architectural projects marked by the close link between space and program, technology and environment. Thus, he created a guide of principles that structured all the buildings in the network, flexibility and extensibility of the construction, creation of green spaces as visual relief, standardization of construction elements and natural lighting and ventilation systems. Lele used to say that an essential reference for his new technological approach was the indi indigenous village of the High Xingu in the Amazon. In this village, he witnessed a very correct architecture in his own words, because of the intelligent adaptation of natural resources to their way of living. Unlike nativist or modernist concerns, this connection with vernacular building traditions did not valorize specific elements or special spatial typologies. Instead, it sought to understand modern Brazilian architecture as a cultural and collective fact. This process resulted in a highly didactic architecture, which reveals the industrial thought of its author and his concerns about materials, costs, bioclimatic conditions, construction, and social impact. Another response to the project of modern Brazilian architecture came from Lina Bombardi. She also searched for a connection with Brazilian vernacular traditions to create an architecture capable of expressing the feeling of belonging. Her primary reference was Brazilian popular art that she knew with some depth after curating a series of famous exhibitions such as Bahia no Iberapuera from 1959. Exhibiting popular art in one of the modern buildings created by Niemeyer in a setting that resembled the space of Atejero, the temple for the Afro-Brazilian religious rituals, was a way of stating the identification of modern and popular. Moreover, this could bring to her architecture the same sense of tradition, collectiveness, and anonymity that she admired in vernacular culture. In opposition to Lele, who was concerned with the industrialization of the construction work, she wanted to incorporate the peculiar culture of uneducated people in the buildings. For the Sao Paulo Museum of Art, for example, she conceived a precise volume with glass facades and structural porticos. Passers-by on Avenida Paulista mixed up with visitors to the museum. High culture, Mashpi has one of the finest art collections in Brazil, approaches the mass culture. The synthetic monumentality of its immediately readable forms made Mashpi, the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo, a symbol of Sao Paulo, precisely because of the architect's sensitivity to its cultural dimension. Other architects, such as Sergio Ferro, 
Rodrigo Lefebvre e Flávio Império, former students of Artigas, took another path in search of an appropriate architectural form. They condemned collaboration with the dictatorial government and went on to criticize modernism and rationalism. They founded the group New Architecture to point out the political flaws of modern architecture in Brazil, which they intended to escape by valuing the participation of the construction site in the projects. Sergio Ferro stated in an interview, and I quote, as long as architecture rejects the expression of work, authentic work, joyful work, autonomous work, it will always be this kind of artificial, cold, scenery, decoration, inhuman. The house Ferro designed for Bernard Whistler, covered by a brick vault, was built practically by one bricklayer that we can see in the picture. <laughs> In the interior, prefabricated partitions divided the space. For the architect, this, con this, con this constructive method proved to be more appropriate to the Brazilian technological stage of that time. It ended up opening a new trend in Sao Paulo architecture concerning both those, the use of brick and vault and the theory of social housing. For them, the ideal image to describe the new construction site would be jazz, with its basic idea of improvisation. Although pleasant, this idea took work outside the sphere of class struggle and demobilized the architect's technical and moral authority and responsibility. Without state support, these architects basically built bourgeois houses that, to some extent, called into question the ostentation and artificiality of bourgeois life. Any historical judgment on modern Brazilian architecture must pass through the ambiguity that constitutes it, to be the realization of an avant-garde that, with the support of the state and without encountering powerful cultural oppositions, sought to shorten an aesthetic and social future that even today it's not possible to claim that it's already extinct or yet to come. Thank you so much. <laughs>